Hi everyone, welcome back to Everyday Anarchism. I'm your host, Graham Colbertson, and this is another edition of Anarchism 101, my series studying the key thinkers and texts of anarchism. Better late than never. This is my interview with Mark Lear on Bakunin, and the conversation is absolutely fascinating. Um, it really helped me put Bakunin in historical context, especially with the conversation I had with Edward Castleton on Proudhon, which I also highly recommend. And Mark also shed huge light on Bakunin's current value as we're debating things like science, democracy, authority. It seems to me that Bakunin is more relevant now than ever. After the music, you can hear that conversation. Enjoy. Today we're talking about Bakunin, and I'm joined by Mark Lear, the author of a book on Bakunin called Bakunin, A Creative Life. Is that right? Did I get that right? A, a Creative Passion. That's a, a reference to a passion. quote. Yeah. Yeah. Go, no, go, go right ahead. Tell us about the quote and the book. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a quote of Bakunin's probably the most famous quote where he says that the 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 passion for destruction is a passion for creation. Sometimes the urge for destruction is the urge for creation, that sort of thing, right? So people have used that to uh, completely define as politics. That's kind of a mistake, but it is a great quote. <laughs> yes, I mean this isn't the outline that I sort of uh, outline with you, but we can jump right into this idea of anarchism associating it with nihilism, violence, terror, assassination. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that's an unfair thing to associate with Bakunin for the most part, but this the, this destruction is also creation, lends itself very easily to, oh, Bakunin just wanted to burn the whole thing down. Is that is that right? So Bakunin's uh, comment uh, that the, the urge to destroy is a creative urge, a creative passion, comes from his days not as an anarchist, but uh, as a Hegelian. Uh, he was uh, a very uh, respected Hegelian philosopher uh, in Russia. He goes to Germany you know, to study, not with Hegel, but to study with Hegelians. Uh, did a course even uh, uh, with uh, Friedrich Engels. <laughs> you know, uh, they were classmates together. Uh, I think Engels actually did a little sketch of him while he should have been taking notes. Um, and uh, the, the unfortunate part is that people have assumed that that, that was the the essence and all there really was to Bakunin's thought. You'll blow it up. It's actually what got me uh, to write this book about him, because in the aftermath of 9-11, everybody, uh, every pundit was saying, oh, this is just violence without reason, without a program, which, of course, was not true of, of Al-Qaeda, not true of Osama bin Laden, and certainly not true of Bakunin, uh, that he was not afraid of what he would call revolutionary violence, the need for it, but uh, is not talking uh, about blowing everything up. Right? Like the like that little, what is the little creature on uh, uh, the Muppet show, right? That just runs around blowing stuff up oh, for the fun an, of it. Animal, animal you mean? Um, oh, yeah, there, there's another one too that oh. literally just walks around with a little, you know, the little, little, uh, little TNT explosive by the boom, right? You know, blowing stuff. Crazy Harry. Crazy I'm Harry on the so Muppet show. Just I, loves to blow I, stuff <laughs> up. That's not a good take on Bakunin, right? Uh, he was not a pacifist. Right? He uh, he understood, uh, however, that the revolution was directed against relationships, right? um, not against particular people. Right? Wonderful. Okay, so uh, this gets us into his thinking, his pre-anarchist thinking. You've mentioned Hegel, so we haven't I haven't really covered Hegel on the show. And, you know, there's a wide range of listeners on this show, professors of philosophy, as well as high school students. So if you don't know who Hegel is, um, Hegel is this uh, idealist German philosopher, which is to say he believes in ideas are what really drives history. And in some ways, he might be considered left wing in, in his time because he's, he's sort of liberal. But he believes that these ideas are sort of moving humanity in this progress. This he, It's this progression of ideas. And so he becomes very exciting for people who believe in progress, famously 
Marx, and they try and take his ideas as socialism was developing and come up with a sort of Hegelian socialism. And then famously, Marx again sort of says, no, 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 no. It, you, you cannot have, you know, Hegelian socialism. You have to throw away this idealism, this belief in the ideas, and get to the cold, hard facts of, of the economic world. And that is the Marxism that we that we have had for the past 180 years since Marx yeah. did that formulation. So how does um, Bakunin fit in to this yeah. moment when Hegelianism is becoming or, or is leaving behind, when left-wing thought is leaving behind Hegelian idealism? Yeah. Well, I think you've, you've hit on a, a really important point, which I think what inspired people like Marx and, and like Bakunin to look to Hegel is that Hegel wants to see history as a process and something in motion. It's not stasis. Right? And if you look at the, his lifetime, I mean, he lives through uh, the, the French Revolution and the, you know, the back and forth of the Napoleonic Wars. And, you know, uh, so for him, taking a look around and thinking, gosh, actually things do change. They change real fast and they change real fiercely sometimes. Uh, made it impossible for him to have views of, of history that were put in place to justify the old order. It's stasis, it's stability, it is the divine right of kings. This, you know, Don't mess with it, right? That was the big lesson there. And that, that's why I think people uh, grabbed onto Hegel for the first time uh, people in working in this Western tradition had a philosophy that said, no, it's always in motion. It's always changing. It's, and, and it changes uh, when things are polarized. Right? So it's not just a smooth evolutionary process. It changes through conflict. Well, you know, as a young person stuck in the, the Russian Empire, you know, bound by its, its traditions and uh, serfdom, which is you know, this heavy weight on not just serfs, but every part of the culture, this was liberating. Right? And I think that explains uh, not Hegel, but the appeal of Hegel to uh, all kinds of revolutionaries like Marx, like Bakunin, uh, like Alexander Herzen. History is alive. We can make it. It's we're not stuck. Good, good. And then it, Hegel in some sense says, we don't make history. Uh, it's ideas that are driving this process. And if you're a revolutionary, you need to grab it away from the idea and take it out on, on the barricade. Is that is yeah. that roughly the sense yeah. of it? Um, I, uh, that would ahead. be the, the the political position that that they moved to. I think initially, though, the idea that history is about ideas is really attractive to intellectuals. It's and because it it does say, look, the work that you're doing, you know, your little study groups, you know, this is this is important, right? This and it, and, and that work is important. The difference about Bakunin, though, was he quickly left that world, which was a world of, of, of circles of, you know, essentially kind of affinity groups and, and book groups and study groups, many of them actually organized by his sisters uh, in Russia. The, the, you know, the uh, whole effect of his family life is something that, that's not been much explored, but because the, uh, the women in his life were hugely significant uh, figures in this. Um, but he, like Marx, wanted to suggest that ideas alone are not enough. That, and that, that change, the, the, well, and Marx himself, you know, is in a, dare I say, dialectic with the whole idea of, of the material and ideas. You know, he says himself that, you know, ideas themselves become a material force when they are taken up by masses of people, but that the world really does not just change because people change their ideas that there is a, a process and for marx this of course is about about production how we produce goods and that stems from this his fundamental suggestion that uh, before we get to have lofty ideas we have to eat and so how we organize our society to do that has an effect on our ideas and that was a position that bakunin would actually accept uh, he would say when we look at it, you know, are the idealists right or the materialists right? Of course, it's the materialists. You know, this is the way the world makes sense. However, let us not underestimate the power of ideas and morality and these kinds of things. Uh, when we look otherwise, at the they wouldn't be. Otherwise, they wouldn't be writing books, right? If they didn't yeah. think ideas had a part yeah. to play. 
Right. Um, we're probably going to continue talking about Marx a decent amount, but before we move on, I wanted to ask you about Proudhon. I'm actually unclear on the extent to which Proudhon is an important figure for Bakunin. So I want to just get your your sense on the relationship between Bakunin and Proudhon intellectually or or personally. I don't know if they had a personal relationship either. Yeah. Bakunin and Proudhon did know each other. And uh, from what we can tell, there's not a lot of correspondence or writing about them, but it seems like they, they got along, you know, and, and at one point Bakunin said, well, people have called me the father of anarchism, but that really needs to get pinned on Proudhon to the degree we want to have fathers of anarchism, which we probably don't, you know, Bakunin I agree. Did, right. <laughs> you know, and Bakunin would as well, you know, but it's Proudhon who used the term. And, um, he appreciated the uh, the spirit of Proudhon, the, you know, the, uh, his revolutionary commitment, but he did differ with him. He really thought that, you know, compared to Marx, uh, Proudhon was not a very sophisticated thinker who was trapped in idealism. So, for, you would say, so in his view, Proudhon had a notion of an eternal sense of justice. Bakunin would say, yeah, it's a little odd how that kind of echoes how a an artisan of Bakunin of, of Proudhon's age would probably see the world. You know, it's probably more than a coincidence. And so he thought that that Proudhon uh, needed to go further in terms of analysis to understand the world, to understand how we could work in it. But what he really appreciated about Proudhon was his uh, commitment to ideas of liberty. And he said, in that he is much superior to Marx for all of Marx's learning which we respect and appreciate and he's done more than any other thinker to help us understand how capitalism works but it is that revolutionary spirit uh, that sense of liberty that we need to remember and appreciate in Proudhon. Okay wonderful uh, so something that you and I have discussed already Mark in previous conversations is that we don't think that that Marxism is is incompatible with anarchism as a field of analysis. Merely the um, the authoritarian element of Marxism, and there's even ways that you can argue that that is primarily a a Leninist misunderstanding. Um, with that said, I think the way Bakunin is understood now is as an alternative to Marx, at least in non-anarchist circles. And my understanding is part of that begins with their response to the 1848. I mean, the rough legend I have heard is that uh, Marx uh, runs away and hides and Bakunin goes to the barricades and, and fights. So to what, extent, so what, what, what does Bakunin do in the revolution of 1848 and how does that affect him? Yeah, although, I mean, I, I make a similar kind of argument but uh, about Marx uh, uh, heading off, but, but we need to be fair. Uh, he'd suffered a lots of, of persecution from the police. Uh, I don't know how brave I would be in certain circumstances, you know, and uh, let's not forget that, that, you know, that he who leaves town today you know, <laughs> survives to fight another day. Right. Um, uh, but it is true, uh, unlike, say, Engels, who was at one point prepared to try to raise a, a military force and, you know, go to Europe to fight, um, Marx did leave. I mean, he did have a, a family to think. You know, I mean, it's uh, I, it's easy to point fingers. You know, I don't know what I would have done in Spain in 1936. And we always hope we're going to be on the right side. But so I probably was a little unfair in my take on it. But the reality is Bakunin did go to the barricades. Um, he fought in, in the uprisings. One of the people he fought with was, was Richard Wagner. You know the uh, the opera uh, dude, <laughs> right? <laughs> and some people have suggested that his character of Siegfried was based in part on Bakunin, and that kind of large, bigger than life, you know, that, that that big spirited character. No evidence of it, but it's it, it's kind of a neat thought, I think. What? Why not? Let's yeah. we can we can keep the legend alive at least. Exactly. That's that's right. So he yeah he was a street fighting man. There's no question about it. Uh, and even uh, Engels, uh, who was a, a pretty nasty towards Bakunin and often said that you know he uh, he did a, a very good job in organizing resistance and organizing street fighting and uh, during these revolutions moments. He was, however, uh, arrested. Uh, Wagner got away, but Bakunin did not, and then was handed over uh, to the Russian authorities you know, by the, uh, the, the German government. You know, 
to speak of a German government is a bit incorrect, but you know, it was a Germanic government, right? <laughs> you know, the state of Germany did not exist at that point. Um, they turn him over to the to the Russians, um, and they put him in jail. And he does about fourteen years in jail, much of it in solitary confinement. Um, I will say, though, that it, it is a sad commentary on our times that in some ways he had more freedom in prison uh, than people do today in the United States or in Canada. It's slightly better conditions in some ways, although uh, he contracted scurvy there and lost all of his teeth. You know, I mean, so it was I don't want to paint this as a uh, it's not like he's in an artist's garret uh, uh, reading and writing, but he does have access to cigars and, you know, and things like that. And people, you know, but um, uh, still pretty brutal, pretty tough. Um, he, he spends, um, he's then sent off uh, to exile in Siberia. Right? Uh, and he spends some time there, uh, but he escapes yeah, from Siberia. He gets a job as a, a kind of a, with a merchant and he's kind of traveling through the area. He does get married uh, then, uh, but then heads out. You know, he makes his way uh, to uh, to the coast, takes a, a ship to, to uh, Japan, then gets on a, a ship to the United States, lands uh, on the West Coast. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just this amazing story. Takes a, takes a ship all the way down and around and up to New York. He meets poets and other people for, from 48 uh, along the way. Then from there back to England. And that's when he really starts to become an anarchist in the 1860s. So after his, uh, his left liberal street fighting phase and uh, after a long time in prison and a long time in, in uh, exile in Siberia. Wonderful. We've covered so much ground. I didn't, I did not know he was in America. That's, that is, that is fascinating. Um, and the one thing I just wanted to mention to the listeners, this is one of my obsessions. We've already mentioned Wagner and Hegel, who these men, if you are familiar with them in a sort of Wikipedia level, you, you probably would think of them as as right wing figures. If you're going to divide the world up into a left wing and white right wing in 2022, you're going to put Wagner and he's sometimes accused of being a proto Nazi. He's certainly an anti Semite. And one of the things I try and keep stressing in this podcast is that these lines that we are drawing, you know, Marx is a Marxist and Bakunin is an anarchist and they can be easily split apart. That's all from that's all from the past. Burke, the founder of conservatism, was a Whig, which is to say a liberal in, in his time. Sorry, I said all from the past. It's all from the future. Us looking back to the past, we draw these lines, and the milieu is, seems to me nowhere near as clear. And we've we've already found that. If if Wagner and Bakunin are fighting side by side, this is a very difficult thing to understand if one of them is the founder of uh, anarchism and one of them is the aesthetic founder of Nazism. But of course, <laughs> people change. But also, these ideas are chaotic and confused. Anarchism as a movement doesn't exist. Nazism certainly doesn't exist. Ideas get drawn in this tangled thread. And I think just, just by doing Bakunin's life, and seeing how he is on the same side as Marx. He's remembered the best now as, uh, for his opposition to Marx as the socialist or communist movement develops. But this is a, a, a simple story that we have laid on the past. Does that sound yeah. correct to you? I, I think that's true. I mean, we, we do it for particular reasons sometimes i mean you know you've you've taught you know that you need to simplify things depending on your audience and of course and you know and if you've taught a first year class if you see the same students at a fourth year class you say something like you know everything i taught you three years ago it's kind of wrong <laughs> but but you need to keep it up so i it's useful sometimes to make these kinds of abstractions and simplifications um but if we want to really understand this stuff and we want to dig deeper um that's as i said that's one reason i started uh, to, to poke around and got the idea to write the book where everyone was saying you know yes mindless violence equals bakunin i'm like no <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> um how do we make this more complicated and more you know uh and the other thing that that pushed me is that so many people uh believe this idea that bakunin was simply about 
uh, violence for the sake of violence. And then they use that to, to dabble with psycho history. Right? Uh, how do we explain this? Well, you know, there's all kinds of reasons. And, and psycho history, like lots of history, it comes and goes in fads. Now, I mean, if someone were writing a history of Bakunin today, they would undoubtedly say he certainly suffered from ADHD. You know, never really finished a book, right? Didn't finish the degree. Just, you know, it was always, you know, jumping, you know. Uh, but then it was more a, a common uh, to to see him as, as being rendered impotent by his uh, incestuous love for one of his sisters. Uh, the lovely thing about that kind of psycho history is that it requires absolutely no evidence. Um, and there is no evidence for any of it. Oh, uh, Mark, it's so much worse than that. The absence of evidence becomes evidence, yes. right? Why, why do you think it was never mentioned? Of yeah, course, right. they knew they couldn't mention it in, uh, yeah. in print. It's like, oh, great. Yeah. Now things that aren't mentioned are automatically true. Wonderful. This is a trouble yeah. for those of us working on text. Yes. So, yeah. So in the book, I, I, I'm poking, I poke fun at this, but, but I do give people the fair warning that, you know, to, Trust me, if you become an anarchist, it does not mean you will be unable to have sexual relations. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, relax, right? There is no causal connection here. <laughs> okay. So. Yeah, I mean, this is this is great. I mean, because the in in some sense, the goal of this podcast was to do this project. Everyday anarchism, it, to, to what extent is anarchism not not that terrifying thing you have heard of? Uh yeah. Uh, so we're, we're we're almost done with this biographical narrative. We've got Bakunin as an anarchist. We've got him in the 1860s. And so it seems to me what we need to cover before we get more deeply into his ideas and his anarchist work late in life is uh, his reaction to the Paris Commune and then the Interna International Working Men's Association, right? That's the, that would attach, that, that's the formal name, but the, yeah. the split between the Marxists and the anarchists, although I'm not sure those those were the two terms used. I think Kropotkin says they were described as the Bakuninists um, mm -hmm. rather than anarchists at that time. So tell us about this, this yeah. famous moment in left-wing history. Right. Yeah. Uh, so in, in 1864, groups of radicals come together and said, we need to be better coordinated. We need to be able to support each other. And they create the international. Now it's known as the first international, but like then, then of course it was just the international, um, and they have they have several congresses and they and they they meet uh, and they debate ideas. Uh, and I have on my bookshelf behind me somewhere two very very thick books on the first international, both written from an anarchist perspective. Uh, so people who want to know every detail and every time somebody you know insulted somebody every tiny little you know i think that for our purposes and again as we talked about to simplify perhaps just a little too much my, but my own take on it is that the actual debates between the anarchists and the, and the marxists um, were not as significant as people would like to 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 make them now unfortunately then we're left to think so then what were they fighting about right um and I'm reluctant to reduce it to just personalities, but I have to say that at the same time, it looks a lot more like a, a social media flame war than it does a reasonable attempt to build organizations. Right? I think that they both had different ideas of how organizations could and should work, but I don't think that this is a simple split between authoritarian Marxists uh, and libertarian anarchists, right? Uh, most of, I think it, it lots to do with uh, Marx's own sense of the need uh, for consistent program, right? Uh, as an organizational tool, uh, Bakunin's resistance to, to that. Uh, but we need to remember that, that Marx uh, had no power in the international in the way that Lenin and then later Stalin had uh, in the Soviet Bolshevik party and in you know in in Russia uh, he could not expel people it required votes to do that he could not take people out and execute them and had no desire to but he was deeply opposed to schisms and to to factions in an organization that was supposed to bring people together unfortunately his way of dealing with that was to say well we're going to just vote and we're going to kick people out if we, you know uh, once we decide on certain kinds of lines here 
anybody involved with the left will be familiar with these kinds of battles. Anybody who's been in, a, in an academic department has seen similar kinds. You know, they reflect all sorts of things. But I don't think it's a useful model to say, hmm, so-and-so was right, so-and-so was wrong, because we've been fighting this battle uh, since the 1870s when they moved and then disbanded the international and haven't gotten any further. Right? So my own take on it is... Uh, that what we can learn from this is that movements require all kinds of different people and we better learn to work together right? <laughs> rather than, than uh, find small differences. You know, what Freud referred to as the narcissism of small differences, uh, of doctrine, of ideas, uh, when what we need to do is organize. To the point that um, the the narcissism of small differences between Marx and Bakunin, and I agree with you, they are relatively small in, in the grand scheme of things. The differences between Bakunin and Lenin are much greater, but there's great differences between Marx and Lenin. So these these small differences have become have become foundational. Bakunin is understood as the man, at least outside of anarchist circles, as the man who disagreed with Marx. Um, I guess I am curious. What's the what's the real sticking point that that that, that initiates the uh, removal of Bakunin and the Bakuninists or the anarchists from the uh, movement? What do they fall out over in terms of organization or ideas? Yeah, I mean, one of the weird things about it is that uh, Marx and Bakunin don't carry on this fight in person in the international. Right. Uh, they don't show up at the same meetings at the same times. You know, they are just because you know, Europe a hard place to get around. There's all kinds of action things going on. It's hard sometimes to move. From um, so it's done through proxies. Right. It's done. It's done uh, uh, by letters and by pamphlets and that sort of thing. Um, I don't think Bakunin wanted to run the international, but he was darn sure he was not going to let Marx run it either or have his way on it. Uh, I think that that both of them used the international as an occasion to develop their ideas and their polemics. Um, uh, but but when you look at the voting, you know, they come comes down to things like, you know, should we what, uh, what should we do about the right of inheritance? Do we want to say we abolish that? We're opposed to that? Um, or that this is something we'll take care of after the revolution comes, you know? Um, and certainly Marx thought that Bakunin was uh, kind of uh, a schemer who loved the idea of, you know, secret groups that, that he would be the secret head of. And you can certainly read parts of Bakunin that way. He even talks about a, a small secret minority that will guide the revolution. And it sounds like, ooh, sounds like a Leninist. And in fact, some critics of, of, of Bakunin, and actually some people who kind of liked him say, ah, that's the real forefather of Lenin. Okay. Uh, but it's also very clear that, that by these kinds of groups, what Bakunin means is something more like what we would call an affinity group, right? a group that would say, um, hey, look, let's think about ideas that, that are coming up from the people themselves, the role of intellectuals, which is something I think that in a sense is the big thing that he and Marx split on, though they never much talked about that, but that was the reality. The role of intellectuals is not to tell workers what to think or what to do, but to develop what Bakunin would call their revolutionary instincts uh, and in ways that are consistent with a much bigger vision of liberty and equality. Uh, we're not keen on the word instinct these days, uh, but it was clear he doesn't mean something uh, the way we think of it in terms of animals or anything like that, but that there was a, a feeling, a, a revolutionary will, even among reactionary workers. He would say that, you know, they are, and, and that's an interesting thing we might want to get back to later, uh, uh, because he wrote a lot about uh, uh, how to work with peasants and workers who were not radical. Uh, who in fact seemed pretty right wing, but he always insisted that if the, the logic of their reality, of their experience, and their ideas is developed and worked on, it's pretty clear where they go with this, right? It's very different than a secret party that will manipulate the revolution and then seize power. Okay, excellent. It sounds it sounds more like the sort of tradition of of self-governance and you know autonomous organizing the way you put it yep absolutely huh. i think the marx however and and it's it gets really complicated because both marx and and bakunin uh had uh 
not untypical, but still ugly uh, views about about ethnicity. Right? Uh, both of them uh, had flares of anti-Semitism. Uh, you can see it. It's particularly vitriolic in Bakunin, but it's also unpublished. You know, I mean, it was like this kind of response to an editor who, uh, who had response to a, sorry, Bakunin's anti-Semitism uh, mostly surfaced in a letter uh, to a newspaper that was never published, you know, where he's just kind of like losing it in the way that somebody might lose it if somebody cuts them off in traffic, you know, and, just, and that's directed uh, at the, the uh, Marx and his uh, uh, machinations within the international. So that's probably too much about that for the audience. But every every time I talk about Bakunin, somebody says, what about the anti-Semitism? Like, yeah. Actually... But, I, I forgot to write that down on my sheet to discuss, but I knew we we had to we had to raise yeah. that issue. And I am quite comfortable with people whose intellectual work is valuable, who also have flaws in their per characters and in their in their thinking, because otherwise we would lose everyone. Yeah, true. Now, but both Marx and Bakunin had very strong uh, ideas of ethnic stereotypes. And so uh, Bakunin, when he gets to, to Prussia uh, as, a, as a young man to, you know, to go to school and wants to go to Berlin, uh, uh, says, you know, oh, you know, Berlin, it's great. Unlike, unlike Russia, it's so free, but the Germans are always are always saluting and clicking their heels. You know, there's this authoritarian streak in the Germans. Uh, and uh, Marx was always like, oh, the Russians, you can never trust them. They're always up to some kind of like weird little scheming thing that can never be open. You know, so they uh, they both said things of this all the time. You know, the problem with the international is these Germans, right? Because they just have these, these kind of national attributes. Now, it, it may well be the case that, uh, uh, that certain experiences and, and developments have a, I don't want to call it a national character, but certain kinds of influences, you know, you know but this, they took that way beyond, and we might th uh, think, and we would denounce this as a kind of, of ethnic stereotyping. That played a big role in this, and to the degree that neither trusted the other's motives, Right? That I think uh, no matter what Bakunin did or what Marx did, the other would be quick to say, ah, up to the old tricks, right? <laughs> Just like every Russian, he's playing a double game. Just like every German, he wants to be an authoritarian, you know? Uh, so that was, I think, a, you know, a huge part of, of this. Um, the, you know, the kind of, because the debates that you can look at, again, you know, one, you know, over uh, the right of inheritance, you know, there was very, very little of, you know, what did we actually do practically to organize, right? Marx was also, uh, you know, not keen to, to write lots of prescriptions and, you know, build for the future. You know, at some point he said, we're not going to write recipes for the, the cookhouses of the future, right? Um, you know, and, and a sentiment that Bakunin would agree with. And so you can pull, uh, all kinds of uh, memos and notes and quotes from each other to say, look, they actually have a lot more in common than we think. The problem is that they uh, could not work this stuff out because partly because they were not really part of a movement that had uh, a, a, a clear sense of what it, what was to be done today after the the yelling and shouting at the internet. What do we do? How do we go back and do this? Right. And if there was a chance for that to happen, the, uh, the 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 schism in the international probably did a lot to prevent there actually being a you know an actionable plan. Yeah. Okay. So let's um, let's get into the text. As you know, what the listeners have heard is you know this chunk from the very beginning of God and the state, and um, I've got lots of stuff I want to talk about from that. Mark, could you just briefly tell the listeners what you know what God and the state is unfinished, as you've mentioned, like like all of his books, and then we can get into this stuff, especially uh, I want to talk about science, which is a, a science and authority, which is a topic that has become very relevant uh, across the world yes. with COVID-19, and that seems to be the place that it will be most valuable for the for the listeners. That, that's that's a great way to, to, to phrase it, to bring us into, I think it's still the contemporary relevance of a piece like God said. So, yeah, it's a fraction of a much larger work that exists than kind of you know, three or four unpublished versions. You know, Bakunin was always writing and rewriting and going off in these crazed, not crazed, but let's say less relevant tangents. You know, he really needed a, a copy editor. I mean, so did Marx for that matter, right? 
right? I mean, they go, but at least he got the damn book out finally. Um, uh, but Gunnar's really only piece was uh, was Statism and Anarchy, you know, written or Statism and Anarchism, written late in his life, and, and written actually in Russian. More typically, he wrote in in French, as a, a good Russian aristocrat would. <laughs> Because he was, you know, he was very well educated. That's the other thing that he has in common with Marx. Uh, both have kind of, you know, uh, uh, sort of a petty bourgeois backgrounds. Marx, the son of a of a very successful lawyer, uh, uh, Bakunin, the son of a minor lord in the very complicated social arrangements uh, of Russia. We think of a lord, and we think, oh, he must be at the you know, the center of all the action. No, they were you know, hundreds of miles from Moscow and and Saint Petersburg. Uh, eking out an existence with the help, let us be, be clear, of about two thousand serfs. Uh, uh, but in a, it's not the big regal life that you would see if you watched a movie, you know, like Nicholas and Alexandria or Anastasia or something. Not the circles of their family here. So it was a it was a much bigger piece, um, uh, and so friends of his took it out and, and then published this as a small excerpt and. It's uh, it's in some ways it's a real the excerpt that you pulled out is is, is great you know because but it, it does start off by you know who is right the materialists or the idealists and if this is your introduction to anarchism as it was you know mine as a teenager it was sort of like uh, kind of not what I thought I was going to find here you know, I'm not even sure what these mean in this context. <laughs> Um, but he does want to say, and he and he said to Marx, "Look, you know, you figured out how this stuff works, and that's great." But the interesting part of this is, yeah, he then goes on to pick up on a theme that is is really Bakunin's, you know, the, 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 which is to say, should learning, should science, should knowledge give someone power over another? And his answer to that is no. I mean, this is the guy uh, who said. You know, basically, to paraphrase Voltaire, if God did exist, we would have to destroy him, right? And, and was no fonder of uh, intellectuals who he said, you know, might even be, you know, right. You know, they may they may have figured some stuff out. But that should not give anyone the right to rule anybody else. And this this feeds right into his critique of Marx as well. That, however right the materialists are, we don't put them in charge. We don't even necessarily agree with their policies. We examine them ourselves and we think about this. Now, he was someone who was deeply interested in science, but was very wary of the, giving scientists and, and people more broadly, I think, intellectuals power. So his famous line is, you know, does this mean I respect the authority of no one? No, I respect the authority of bootmakers. When it comes to boots, I, I ask them, what should I buy? How should I think about this? Do I want this boot made out of leather? Do I want it made out of silk? What do we, but I don't let the bootmaker choose for me. Right? Now he did insist un, unlike people today who are fond of conspiracy theories, um, would insist that we need to pay attention to science. People need a great deal more training in science. Science reveals the world as it is, as best we can figure it out, knowing that it's always provisional and things change and our ideas change. And uh, both Marx and Bakunin understood something that uh, uh, po postmodernists think that they kind of invented was the idea that science is informed actually by the societies in which it arises and the people in it. It's not a completely, but it's better than just guessing. right? Um, it's better than just making stuff up. But the question then is authority. And for him, that applies uh, both to how we build organizations, how we think about the role of, of leaders, um, and what our dream of a future society should look like. So in that sense, it's a, it's a lovely piece to get that kind of essence of Bakunin. Once you get past the, you know, it's an idealist, materialists, uh, but, you know, okay, sure, that we know that the Romans come and play their role, but really we think the Greeks had shit figured out way better in certain kinds of ways, even if they were doomed, you know, it's like, oh crap, you know, how does this help me build the revolution? But once you're through that, that, that vision that inspires, that says that we demand equality and liberty, and unlike uh, some liberals and conservatives, uh, Bakunin said, in fact, we, we are not in a fight between liberty and, and equality. We literally cannot have one without the other. You know, and then this starts to zing. And then we get that sense of uh, the role of, of intellectuals, the role of, of everybody else in building, uh, building the world we want to see. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, 
in the very first uh, Anarchism 101 segment, Kathy Ferguson brought up this this idea of equality versus liberty. And if you if your starting point is that equality and liberty are incompatible, you will have to choose between those two if that's where you start. And uh, I do not, I don't wish to start there and Bakunin doesn't start there. Um, yeah. I do think it's really important what you were saying um, about how we need more, more science. I mean, the, the argument that I see Bakunin making is this idea that science should be in charge, that science should have both, you know, um, epistemological authority, the authority of knowledge, and also a political authority is not only a misunderstanding of what political authority does to people, which is to say it makes them corrupt, but it's a misunderstanding of science itself. The example I've used time and time again is it took roughly a year for the World Health Organization to acknowledge that uh, COVID was airborne and that things like masks were more important than things like hand washing. Now, that does not make me anti-science. It was, in fact, scientists. It was the scientific process that revealed that. The danger is what Bakunin calls the academy, the group of people who are stable in their knowledge that their science is correct. And when other people state their scientific ideas, those people don't have to be listened to because they are not in this academy. And I thought that that is a great example of what Bakunin is coming about. The, the authority of science established as an institution, as a governing body, as politics, is, does not mean trusting science. In fact, it means stopping science from doing the work that we need it to do so vitally. Yeah, that's a really good point, Graham. I mean, we see the uh, that you know that just taken to its absurd lengths when we look at the Lysenkoism right in the Soviet Union, where oh. you know where you know, the the idea that now, in fact, we find out that there's a more to Lysenko than than we may have thought that we that, that genes themselves you respond to conditions, and so the whole nurture nature thing is even more complicated than we thought. But but for your listeners who will uh, need a, a slight well very vulgar but in short uh, take on Lysenko, this was a uh, a, a Russian you know, plant biologist who said and insisted that uh, organisms could pass on acquired characteristics right so uh the, the silly example would be you know if you got a scar from an injury you know you might be able to pass that on genetically um, and that's really not how most genetics works the genes do adapt and change and you know so it's way complicated but his that notion was that we could change wheat right in the laboratory and then they would pass on better growing characteristics to uh the next generation of seeds and 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 growing of, of wheat this was something that stalin loved because great you know we're going to do this stuff in the laboratory then we're going to just improve the wheat it's going to pass it off it's going to be fabulous it's gonna be... and that became official dogma even though it never actually worked and didn't work and people were were uh, purged from the academy for saying you know excuse me comrade but uh we have a hard time replicating this yeah but i have it on the highest authority said lysenko the highest authority which meant lenin that it does so um so that's it this i mean it almost it's, it's almost satire you know what happens with lysenko except of course it's terribly tragic uh in that good science was just was simply pushed aside for political reasons but bakunin had two other points because he wouldn't uh, limit this just to what we would think of as science and then he used the word science it would be more like a word we, like knowledge that we would use uh, so it would extend that uh, idea that you don't let the people who know a lot about a subject to make decisions for you right or back to the boot makers however much they know that's great but i still make the decision and how this is going to work for me and that extends to um, his critique of what we might call technocracy, um, the, you know, the, the idea that experts should be in charge. Right? Uh, and, he, and part of his response was like, no expert could ever know uh, how complicated human life is and how complicated even another individual's life is. And so there is no way we should permit them to have that kind of authority and control over our lives. And pushed it again to say and that especially goes for revolutionary groups and my comrade carl here who's pretty bossy <laughs> right? oh, that's excellent yeah i i want to pick up on the technocracy thing the science you know 
the, the science example is so important right now because of COVID. Another very important example, though, is economics. There are all sorts of people who think that the foundational, the foundational premises of macroeconomics uh, do not work, are, are flawed. A number of them are famous macroeconomists who have written that, you know, macroeconomics, which is the way we make decisions if we're worried about something like unemployment or inflation, which is what gets all the headlines. This is, you know, why we have leaders to deal with things like inflation and unemployment. There's a sizable group of people in macroeconomics who believe that macroeconomics cannot give us answers. Besides all of us outside who just take a quick look at macroeconomics and seems like this is, this has nothing to do with the world I see. And yet the, it is people trained in macroeconomics who keep making decisions about things like employment. The, the most important thing in a capitalist system is being made by quote experts, even though we can't tell, and some of those experts can't tell that they have any idea what they are doing. And again, it seems like McKunin could have seen and, and predicted this, that uh, rule by Larry Summers is not, uh, is not the right way to do it. But if you protest, it says, well, that's because you do not uh, understand. And I think the boot maker is like, hell, I understand what I want on my foot. So you, you tell me how to get that. That's right. The other point that Bakunin and Marx, too, uh, saw was that these so-called authorities um, often don't have political or economic power themselves, but they work for those who do. And they work to give those people the answers that they want. Right? So the problem is not just that there are some economists out there that have their own ideas and thoughts. That the reality is they are paid uh, by corporations and by governments to come up with ideas that, ooh, surprise, help corporations and governments right, with this. Um, you know, it, Marx has this nice little quote in, in one of the, I think, uh, forwards to the second or third German edition. You can look it up, German edition of Capital, where he just says, look, once the bourgeoisie uh, became the dominant uh, political as well as economic power, uh, the economists all became like hired prize fighters for them. Right? They were not interested in truth. They really, we would just say, became propagandists. And that's true of so much economics. It's There have been studies that, that suggest that uh, the primary thing that first year uh, macroeconomics does is make people more selfish. It just pounds these, these simplistic ideas into their heads. And so the people then end up thinking, the law of supply and demand is how everything works. Well, at one level, the law of supply and demand is a uh, a social uh, phenomenon that says it's okay for you to charge whatever you can get for a product. If somebody really needs it, you can jack up the price. Well, historically, and even today, there are lots of societies that would say, if you do that, we're going to beat the living crap out of you because that's not how we do things in here. Right? And I would say, is, you know, you don't get to hog. The good stuff, right? That whole idea of the law of supply and demand to set prices, it's, it's just a great example of, of your point about macroeconomics. This is a kind of fundamental thing here that's just an assumption that's okay to do that. You're simply and we can not look, allowed to question it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And we can look even more closely because I would say that all of your listeners and everybody they know actually has some social connections where the law of supply and demand doesn't work. Uh, if you have a family that is not a family of sociopaths, the law of supply and demand does not figure out how you get necessities of life. If you treat your friends only by the law of supply and demand, even if what you're giving them is love and affection and not just material things, if you treat them like that, yeah, people do start wondering, you know, I think old Joe here might have a bit of the sociopath to him. Uh, so it's only in very specific areas uh, uh, that, that the law is supposed to apply. But of course, even, but the same principle is there. It just says, yeah, it's a right that says, You've got it. Somebody wants it. You can screw them over. <laughs> and how can you disagree with these people? They, in fact, have the Ph.D. in the subject and or, in fact, not just have a Ph.D., but are in charge of the U.S. economy. And yeah. this takes us to the next thing, which is universal suffrage, because then there's the argument that fundamentally you have made this choice, dear voter, because you elected someone who appointed someone who has the right PhD and they get to do this thing that, you know, who that, that has this enormous effect on your life. And it is okay because it's democracy. And, 
As with Prudhomme, Bakunin makes very clear that universal suffrage does not make something good or right or or democratic in any sort of the way that we want democracy. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, he understood it uh, as a as a very you know, shallow form of social organization that replicated power that the state uh, enabled capital and capital needed the state to to do things like you'll know, clear the land uh, of people that is uh, North America uh, to uh, legitimize slavery to legitimize capitalism so yes absolutely uh, the irony, of course, is that Bakunin, again, like Marx, actually had a much stronger sense of democracy. If we mean by that, rule by the people. And if we mean something like participatory democracy that extends not just in that sort of political sphere, you know, should we raise tariff rates, uh, you know, or something, uh, but much more importantly to the area of work where any pretense of democracy goes out the window the minute you cross that threshold and start to work. The boss is the boss. They get to boss you around. Um, and there's no pretense that this is democratic. I mean, now, both Bakunin and, and, and Marx thought that, you know, they were not opposed to reforms, right? I mean, they, they thought that, you know, they did say, look, there's no question that the fundamental uh, exploitation and oppression of people by capital and the state requires a revolution. Uh, but both of them said, but, you know, if you can make, get some improvements in the short term, that's great. Right. Uh, Marx seemed to have a lot more faith in some possibility for reform than Bakunin did. And I suspect that this in part reflects their very different experiences after uh, 1848, where Marx goes to England. He sees the fight for the eight hour day, uh, sorry, the 10 hour day. He sees some successes. He sees that there are some improvements that are possible, right? And, and maybe in Britain and, you know, maybe in the United States, maybe uh, the revolution will take place through an electoral process, but probably not, right? But Kunin, of course, spent those years in, in a czarist dungeon uh, and in Siberian exile. And so he had no illusions about uh, a state making reforms, even when pressured to by mass movements. Wasn't opposed to it, but was not as sanguine as Marx was about the possibility of, of reform coming from the state. You know, the idea is that if, if somebody hands you a right, look at it very carefully because it's probably just a wrong disguised as a right. And, and certainly one of the best con jobs played on people is the idea that a parliamentary system or a republic empowers us. Excellent. Um, I, this has come up over and over again on this podcast. Uh, I, I, it seems to me that there's no contradiction between the idea that um, a, a parliamentary system is clearly not going to be the answer, is clearly not going to deliver uh, liberation. And yet, within a parliamentary system, it very much matters mm -hmm. who the elected officials are and what the laws are. And so you can work towards the abolition of a parliamentary system and work towards making the parliamentary system better at the, at the same time. I personally do not see those as two separate projects. Mm -hmm. um, or even if they're two separate projects, they do not contradict one another. They they don't. They certainly don't in theory. Part of the problem, though, and this is something that Bakunin talked a lot about, um, it does become a problem when some people say, you know, I like my job as a politician a whole lot better than I liked my old job. Right? And so now I'm going to make decisions that are consistent with me getting reelected. Right. I mean, so, we, we're back to the scientific academy. As soon as that is established, your top job is to keep your job in the scientific academy. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. And also at the university, you know, if uh, I'm not in the science uh, faculty, but yeah. It's a, and so people do. So he, he was and, and was very perceptive about that. He did have a, I think, a, a sense of of uh, the contradictions and issues that people face when put in those kinds of positions. Um, and. Thus, he said, what we need to do is to remove the temptation. That's part of the revolutionary project is to, is not just to change who the owners are right? or to say, oh, we're going to make sure everybody gets a little more you know, oatmeal. That's that's the revolution, comrade. So you know, get, get back to work of the grain fields, but to figure out how to empower people at just at every level. 
with this, that the revolution was about freeing people, to giving people uh, more time, using science, yes, to reduce terrible uh, jobs and conditions. Uh, so people, I mean, Kurt Vonnegut said it nicely some years ago, and he said, you were put on this earth to fart around and don't let anybody tell you any different. And that's the, that the kind of, that's the liberatory dream. You know, we, we have figured out how to provide enough for all. Now we need to distribute it and also distribute power equally so we are not oppressed by others who do think that they prefer this job as a politician to being out there in the grain field. And so they make decisions that will keep themselves in power. And those are always to the detriment of the people that they are supposed to be in charge of. It's true in unions, you know, it's, and, and Bakunin would said, look, it's also true in revolutionary movements. And this is why Carl is really bugging me with his authoritarian ways in the, in the international now. I'm, much of that was, was Bakunin being right about the implications, but I would say not the actual reality that he faced. It's why the, uh, uh, the detective uh, novelist, um, uh, Walter Mosley, in a little novella uh, where Bakunin gets mentioned, says, you know, Bakunin was actually the best political philosopher of the 20th century, even though he didn't live in it, because he understood and predicted Stalin. Right. And what yes. that would mean, right? I, I couldn't agree more. Um, this is so enlightening. Whether or not um, his analysis was the one that was needed in 1870, mm -hmm. maybe not. But boy, was his sense that the the uh, there, there's a lot of talk that what John Dewey wanted and Dewey's technocratic disciples that there's a great distance between them. And people like Randolph Bourne say, Ah, but I could see that in your thinking. I could see where it was going. This sounds like the same situation. Marx didn't want uh, Bolshevism, but it was pretty easy, or it was easy for Bakunin to see with clarity that Bolshevism could grow out of Marxism. Yeah, that's um, a really good way to put it. Yeah, We are running out of time. Is there anything, I mean, we covered so much, but is there anything left you would you would like to, to say to, to take us out? Um, Oh, good question. Let me think about this for a second. I think we've covered most of the stuff. I mean, we didn't, I, I can talk a bit more about anti-Semitism, although I think, I always think it's a, uh, it's a distraction for the reasons that, that you've suggested and because it plays a very small part in his work. I mean, it's ugly and nasty when it's there. Um, um, but I, I guess I would, I, yeah, one point I would make that you can you know, edit out or not is that, um, with the election of 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 donald trump um uh, a lot of people on the left turned to marx's uh the 18th brumaire right um to look at all you know the factions that supported trump that supported authoritarianism uh you know, marx has a line i'm going to butcher it but it's something like you know, we want to understand how something as you know grotesque as bonaparte could come to power <laughs> uh, representing uh, no one. He he looked like he represented everyone. And I thought that's not a people thought that's a pretty good way to think about Trump. They've also talked about the lumpen proletariat supporting Trump, etc. It's all you know. There's we need a lot of more empirical data. It makes it much more complicated than that. But in a pamphlet that he wrote uh, after the the Paris Commune of 1871, Bakunin also had some insight into uh, people uh, that you might think would have. A vested interest in revolutionary radical ideas supporting absolute reactionaries and it was a i think a very insightful piece that again points to his understanding of of humans yeah and and in their lived experience where he said look it's true that you know the, the parisian workers were not supported by rural peasants in France. In fact, rural peasants returned, you know, Bonaparte. They were happy to proclaim him as the emperor. Uh, what's going on there? But he did say, look, part of it is for them, the emperor, it's almost like a, a figurehead, but represents something bigger than the local politician, the landlord, the merchant that is immediately screwing over the peasant. Uh, and so I thought in, in some ways, thinking about that, about Trump then presents these aspirations in a sick and twisted way. But if the alternative is the bureaucrat, the technocrat, who is calm and has no passion and seems inhuman and says, oh, and 
we are seizing your property because you didn't make your mortgage payment or you're fired because you didn't do whatever you were supposed to do here, uh, then voting for Trump, voting for, for Bonaparte becomes a, a kind of release. Right? It's uh, a, that and an expression of their immediate anger at their immediate circumstances. Yeah. Um, he also had a good thing to say about socialists. He said, look, part of the problem is a lot of you socialists are a bunch of snot-nosed intellectuals. And when you talk to peasants, you treat them like rubes. Well, of course, they're going to say you're a jerk and they're going to run from socialism. And that's uh, we, we build a movement. We don't go in there saying, OK, listen up, Chowderhead. I've got this all figured out. Right? Uh, and that was his accusation of a lot of leftists at the time. And by extension of Marx, who you know, would spend you know, years writing, uh, how does capitalism work? And Bakunin loved capital, thought it was brilliant. He said, but he's trying to make intellectuals out of the workers. He's not reaching them where they live and is preaching at them and then would say, and if you don't figure it out, then you're an idiot. And so we're going to kick you out of the international. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> a gross I, simplification, uh, but that was the process that Bakunin <laughs> thought it was working through here. I'm thrilled to hear that about Bakunin because that is my own um, analysis of the Trump phenomenon. Uh, R Richard Rorty died before Trump was elected, but he wrote in a book uh, that was published in the 90s that if the technocracy continued, eventually the white working class were, were going to pick a strong man, a strong man who would not actually represent them, but who would promise to uh, take it out on the, the bankers and the lawyers and the professors who were dominating the lives of these people and doing so with condescension or in a bloodless way or with a self-satisfaction of their own merit. And in that respect, I, you know, I blame Trump's election on the people who voted for Trump, but I also blame it for the people who thought they could be in some way left wing and the party of lawyers and bankers. And I can say this because I am not tenured professor. It is, yep. uh, that, is not, that is not a way to convince people who have very little, who are struggling to eat, who see no route to success for their children, who cannot go to these schools where these bureaucrats are trained. That is not the way to convince them that you have their best interest at heart. And I find it wonderful that Bakunin saw that all those years ago, although terrible, that in my opinion, the intellectual left is still mostly making that same mistake. Yeah, well, it's the temptation of, of intellectuals. You know, we, we spend our lives uh, digging, getting things right. And no one gives us the power that we deserve because we figured this amazing stuff out. Well, we don't deserve it. And lots of what we do is wasted effort um, uh, in the sense that it's not helping people. It's not, and, and yet we depend on, on the taxes of all of these people to give us uh, the luxury. And it's a very huge luxury of time uh, these days, especially if people have tenure. I know the life of a, of a sessional or adjunct uh, instructor and professor is not the same as a tenured uh, a person. You know, um, uh, it's much harder and much tougher, uh, and, that, and that's the reality of neoliberal universities in a capitalist society. Sadly, and and the absolute lack of places um, where you can do this kind of work and get paid for it. That's also dried up. Absolutely. Um, I, this has been this has been wonderful, Mark. Thank you so much for for coming on, on the show. I learned a lot about Bakunin, um, and I have new ways to apply him to today. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you. Okay, thanks again to Mark. His work on Bakunin is absolutely fantastic. I've got a link to his book in the show notes. Remember, you can go to everydayanarchism.com to find out more about Anarchism 101 and the schedule, although. The schedule is currently in flux, but I do intend for it to continue throughout the year. You can look forward to that and find all of the previous episodes at everydayanarchism.com. If you're able to, please support the show, tell a friend, leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcast, go to the website, pledge financially if you can. Anything you can do to keep this little podcast alive, I am so appreciative. And as always, to those of you who are leaving reviews telling friends and supporting financially. Thank you again. This podcast would have already folded without you. All that's left to say is that the music which you're about to hear is by David Hill.